Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin Beat Media Podcast. Before we get into the main show, I have to tell you how you can support my work. The way I found my work, whether it be a review of a movie I rented or paying for Zoom, my Patreon is the way you can help offset those costs. Patrons like Mbula Bula, Brian Scuttle, David Walters, Joseph Davis of Sip Pop, Matthew Simpson of Awesome Friday, Tom Blackbird, and more help make episodes like this possible. So thank you to all of my lovely patrons out there. Beyond financial support, you can get some pretty sweet perks. Whether you're into 40-hour early access to my reviews and this podcast, monthly surveys, giving direct feedback, commentaries, and just about everything in between, consider becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash austinbmedia. You can also save 16% if you decide to subscribe annually. On top of that, if you're not ready to subscribe, you can get a seven-day free trial on every tier I offer. With that said, let's get to the show. Hello, my name is Austin Belzer, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast. Today, in this episode, rather, I'll be discussing a decision to leave with my guest, Seth Vargas, co-host of the Movie Friends Podcast, and one of the fellow members of the International Film Society Critics, one of the, I think, three groups I'm in. I'm in Film Independent, OFTA, Online Film and Television Association, and IFSC. Welcome to the podcast. Can you start by telling our listeners or watchers or wherever uh, a bit about yourself and your work? Hey, thank you very much for having me. It's not much to me, really. I love movies. I love friends. And so it was a pretty easy thing to put together when we decided to start a show. The show that I run with my friend, Michelle, Mm. who has been a podcaster for probably about 12 years now, but she primarily focuses on television. And when we decided to start the show, the gist of it is that I'm introducing her to movies. Each month we have a different theme, and then we pick four or five movies. We do that theme, and for the most part, stuff that she's never seen before. And we just try to approach it from a place of like learning, where if she doesn't love a movie, we don't fight about it. (laughs) Because we think it's better to be friends than to be right, quote unquote. Yeah. Yes. Do your patrons pick that those topics or do you just have a list like I do where it's, here are the things I have on my radar? Yeah, I try to pick movies that kind of cover a genre. Like, for example, this month for October, instead of just doing horror movies, we did what we called Franktober, where we focused on films that explore the themes of Frankenstein. So we started out with Frankenstein from 1931. But then we went to Edward Scissorhands, we right. did Young Frankenstein, and then we're finishing the month with Rocky Horror Picture Show. So we try to incorporate different genres. We try to do our best to incorporate films made in other countries, not just say, oh, these are the the four highest rated on IMDb or Letterboxd for this <laughs> genre, because I'm trying to give her like a well-rounded experience. Yeah, I feel like... Uh... If somebody just went through the top 250 of Letterboxd, it would be chaos. It would just be yeah. <laughs> Spider-Verse, Godfather. That you'd have emotional whip emotional and tone whiplash. Yeah. Which is why I, I have probably only watched like 13% of the two top 250 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, there's a lot of great stuff, both of those lists that I just mentioned, but I try to curate it more towards my tastes but also her tastes yeah because if you start talking about a kurosawa movie and she's just absolutely not yeah it's mm-hmm. not gonna be a good podcast episode but yeah and i guess in that vein do you have any recommendation for before you get into the main discussion on the movie show game or album that you're listening to Hey, so I will always recommend the one season of the greatest TV show that has ever been made, Freaks and Geeks, currently streaming on Hulu. If you guys haven't, if you haven't experienced it, you absolutely need to. That movie, I'm sorry, that that show is famous for having every person who would go on to be famous over the next 10 years, Seth Rogen, James Franco, Linda Cardellini, even Shia LaBeouf makes an appearance in an episode. It's pretty crazy. Ben Foster is in it, I think two or three episodes. So yeah, that's always, whenever someone says, what should I watch? It's usually one of the first things that I say. And then you mentioned Kurosawa, a different Kurosawa made a film called Cure. 
1997. Okay, yeah. yeah, Japanese horror film. It's just one of the best. And this whole month, whenever anyone is asking for recommendations for what to watch, I've just been hammering Cure out there. I want as many people as possible to see it because to me, uh, I love genre and I love genre bending, blurring the lines between what is and what isn't. Because anything that makes us uncomfortable and anything that makes us think outside the box, I think is something that should be experienced. And Cure for me is like one of the one of the boundary lines of horror where, yes, you have a little bit of gore, but it disturbs you in a way that it, it's hard to communicate. And to me, it's, <laughs> if you wanted to, if I had to make a list of like 10 essential horror films, Cure would be near the top. Yeah, I think I, I haven't seen it, mm -hmm. full disclosure. So like my horror list would be trash because... My, I think my first exposure to horror was seeing Saw. <laughs> oh, sure. So hey, that's Saw's automatically, good. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, it, I guess the stepfather, although that's not technically horror, that's more like a psychological thriller. But the one from like 2009 or 2008. Okay, sure. Yeah. Because I think that works better going back. Although the PS3 references are really interesting. <laughs> But I actually have an out, not so out there, but like out there in the way I discovered it recommendation. Okay. I was hanging out with some neighbor friends of mine. We we're having dinner together and they were like, hey, have you seen Little Shop of Horrors? And obviously I have. Yeah. I, I was in theater class. That's like quintessential to theater class. And if your theater class isn't showing that, they should be. <laughs> or maybe like the tragedy of Macbeth, the new one. Is pretty good. Sure, sure. But they were talking about the 19, I think it was like 1980s, the Steve Martin, like where they had Steve Martin, Rick Moranis. Yeah. But we didn't have H, not, it's not HBO Max anymore. Max is what the, that version's on. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm not spending 15 bucks to watch that version. Sure, sure. And another version of the, same movie popped up. It was a different interpretation. It's by Roger Corman. Yes, um, Roger Corman's Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. It's so interesting because it's so not a musical at yeah. all. Mm -hmm. It's narrated by a like a hard-boiled cop that shows up two or three times throughout the movie. And it's so interesting because it you, you think about adapting Little Shop of Horrors and you don't think that like straight line hey here's what life on skid rose here's mm -hmm. what it would actually be like instead of oh hey everyone's singing and dancing uh, yep and has an underrated i think performance from jack nicholson a very yeah, young jack nicholson <laughs> that's usually the one thing that people do remember from corman's version it's good but considering the the version that we get like when we look at the source material and then what we get in the uh, musical version, there's quite a leap in entertainment value, I would say. <laughs> yeah, because. But hey, no like, shade to Roger Corman. Corman's no, great. No shade. Yeah. It's a good interpretation. I, I just think if somebody had shown me that in theater class, I would have been like, why are people, why do people like this musical? Mm -hmm. But I actually really liked the Bushnick character. The owner of the shop is interesting. And also very humorous in a very dark way. But yeah, I'd recommend that. It's You have to rent it for three bucks, but it's three bucks. Sure. Um, hey, when I was a kid, you had to rent everything for more than three bucks. You had no choice. Yeah, 50 bucks for the VHS tape or something like yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah, I recommend that. Although I will say if you're if you're at all like it has some color banding issues, like it's mm -hmm. very clear that it was shot in black and white and converted to color later. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if you have hang up on that, like just let them go and watch it. Yeah, yeah, because it's you can definitely tell it's made for five dollars in a dream. Uh, hey, look, I think as a movie lover, you should be able to turn off any anything that a movie could have in poor quality, whether that's sound. If you're going to get into the uh, Giallo films, 
of the uh, 70s and early 80s from Italy. You have to let go bad sound and ADR and acting. I think you should be able to I think you should be able to just as much as we suspend our disbelief when we enter into a story. We should also suspend like anything because a good movie can possess really bad qualities and still be a good movie. So. Yeah. Christopher Nolan's following suffers mm-hmm. the same issues. Really when bad ADR. Maybe my second favorite Christopher Nolan movie of all of his oh, films. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it's great. I, I always say Oppenheimer's I, I, there. Yeah. Oppenheimer is good. Yeah, that, that was but recently good. biased. Yeah. I always say I would love to live in a world where Nolan stayed like making these street level movies like following or memento where the budget and the effects don't get in the way of the clever story. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, who knows if he could do that now, if he could just say, I'm going to make a movie for $10 million, I think it would be (laughs) pretty amazing. Yeah. And, yeah, I would definitely prefer that other than the marketing machine that's go experience like this nuclear explosion. And I'm yeah. like, no. Yeah, I think all that when we're told something and then we're given something different, all it can do is set you up for disappointment. And But yeah, he could make a movie in secret, drop it on Netflix, and it would be the most watched thing <laughs> immediately. So he doesn't at this point, he doesn't need all of that marketing nonsense yeah and m night Shyamalan's a great example of it i i mm-hmm. think because knock at the cabin came out and people were like yes we want to see that yes please sure. more and he just m night Shyamalan just hides away for a year and then he's hey i got a new movie here you go mm-hmm. yeah but with that said we're not here to talk about oppenheimer following <laughs> anything like that we're here to talk about decision to leave yeah So yeah, let's just get into it. I know earlier before we started recording, you talked about seeing Decision to Leave at Alamo Draft House. So yeah, I would love to hear about that. Yeah, it was cool. I did did a a day at the movies with my friend. We saw three movies in theaters, Tar, Decision to Leave, and for the life of me, I can't remember what the third one is, unfortunately. If I went back and looked at what was out that weekend, I probably would be able to tell you, but... We saw a tar and decision leave at the Alamo Draft House in New York City, the financial district one. And it was my first time at a draft house. It was super cool. I didn't really eat or drink anything. I think we got popcorn. Really? Maybe. Yeah, because it was like, my thing is, hey, I'm in New York City. I'm not going to eat food at a movie theater. I'm going to go... <laughs> when the movie's over in between movies and go eat at an actual place. Cause even if I get dollar slices, it's going to be better than a movie theater. (laughs) Yeah. Fair. But what I was most appreciative of at that showing was they had a little presentation from Park Chan-wook where he explained, he was like, I wanted to make a movie that was both like a police thriller and a romantic comedy And I wanted to blur the lines so that you didn't know which one you were seeing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And he said that and I was like, oh, okay, all right. Because I'm a big believer in not watching trailers or previews if I know it's a movie I'm going to see. If not to throw shade at this movie, but like the Super Mario Brothers movie, right? I'm going to go see that with my kids, but I'm not like, oh, I don't want to know anything. I I pretty much know what I'm going to be getting with the Super Mario Brothers movie. But with like Killers of the Flower Moon that just came out, I didn't watch any trailers, anything like that. And the next Park Chan-wook movie, definitely. Boy and the Heron, I have seen nothing from I'm going into that completely blind. So I was glad that he explained that because as the movie was going, I was like, okay, if I didn't know what he had said, I would be very confused with the tone of this movie. Yeah, I I definitely got that my first time around because Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have that explanation. So I just went into it dry. I didn't I maybe saw a trailer, Mm -hmm. um, maybe like when Mubi acquired it, I believe. Yeah, Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I think I saw that trailer because I always like seeing movies trailers because they're always like 
they don't show a lot. They yeah. just like here's the premise, and it's coming to movie at this date. Um, like the how to have sex trailer was great, but yeah, I didn't have that, so I was like, oh, what am I getting here? Uh, especially since I had not seen a Park Chan Wook film. Uh, oh, this is your first one. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, so I didn't have any expectation for what was going on. I just knew people were talking about it. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll watch it. I can't remember if this was a Spirit Awards nominee movie or if I went and saw this myself. But okay. for whatever reason, I was like, yeah, I got to go see this movie. Whatever it takes. I think I probably streamed it on movie. It's been like a year almost to the day. I would love to see the Criterion Collection because I knew, I know they just released that like this week as of recording. I'd be interested to see if that video is on there. After seeing this, have you seen any of his other movies yet? No, I was, my, the plan was because I heard Neon acquired, just not to believe, Old Boy Remastered. Yes. So I'm waiting yeah. for that one to come okay. out All right. for rent. Because All right. Yeah, because I'm just like, okay, old, I live in such a rural area that I knew I wasn't going to get Old Boy remastered. Sure, sure. I, I'm actually surprised we got Killers of the Flower Moon, given its subject nature mm. at, at, and the political landscape of where I live. And, but yeah, I, I got to wait for that to become available for rent. I checked, I believe, yesterday, and it's still not available for rent. I either have to buy it or wait for the blu-ray or whenever it becomes available for rent but you are in for some like life-changing stuff <laughs> yeah I, I i definitely know it's inspirations because i know a lot of people were talking about when daredevil season one came out the hallway yep. fight mm -hmm. in that yep. they the director said uh was directly inspired by old boy yeah yeah also old boy but also the handmaiden he has another one called JSA. Okay. Stoker is one that just recently came to my, I've seen it and I've like almost watched it a few times, but some people that I like really trust recently said it's like one of the best movies they've ever seen. But wow. yeah, Park Chan-wook is, he's a guy that no matter what I'm going to see, I'm going to see what he's putting out. Definitely. And yeah, I don't know if I made it sound like I didn't like this movie on my first <laughs> viewing. I did. I really did. I was just watching it again last night in preparation to record this. All of the humor struck me so much harder than it did on my first watch because I was like, oh, this movie is actually funny the whole way through pretty much. And yeah. because I knew what to expect from the story, I was more relaxed and so I think I took the humor better. Yeah, I think it's definitely when it's I think it's when I saw it, I think I definitely noted that I was just like, man, I'm putting too much stock into the, every single word and, and not mm. an, analyzing it way too much. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely I, I want to see it like a third time. Mm -hmm. I just want to do a like one straight week of watching and see how that uh, changes over time. Sure. Maybe when Old Boy comes out for rent, I'll do like <laughs> Old Boy, Handmaiden, Stoker, or I guess, would Stoker come after this? No, Stoker was before Decision to Leave. This is okay. his most recent, yeah. Yeah, so just four days of bang, bang. Yeah, you're gonna, that's gonna be an intense week emotionally for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but... I guess with that said, we're already hinting at it, but what were your overall thoughts on the movie? Especially, how did it change the second time around? So my overall thoughts are, as I previously mentioned, talking about Cure, I love when a movie surprises me. I love when we take a genre and we mash it up with another genre when you've seen a lot of movies and you see a movie that really sticks to the rules, mm -hmm. it can be good. And you can, uh, I can 
accept its quality and I can appreciate what it is. But when a movie surprises me, that is when I'm really excited. And it's you sit up and you're alert and it just grabs you in a different way than just, okay, I see the three act structure at work here. And <laughs> I see in this one, I really didn't know what to expect, especially when we hit the kind of midway point of yeah the second husband now. You, I think... I know what this is. I think, okay, this is a police procedural about a woman who seems very suspicious. I don't know if she's that suspicious. But then when it happens again, you're like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I thought the whole movie was going to be just on the first case. And why wouldn't you think that? You know what I mean? Like, you wouldn't start this movie out thinking, oh, they'll both move to a new town and there will be a new husband and it will all happen all over again. So, yeah, that... That really threw me for a loop. I know that this is really silly, but <laughs> this movie has something that I'd never seen before. And it just, it tickled me so much when I first saw it. And that is the, the chain mail glove that he uses to disarm. <laughs> yeah. So he yeah. just has that at the... Yeah, maybe he just always has that in his pocket. And I waited for it to come back around. Never comes back around. But it was just so cool and interesting and i was like man i love this moment even last night watching it i was like oh yeah i know i know <laughs> this movie also has awesome transitions sometimes yeah. we will yeah sometimes the camera will change right on the last line of a monologue or a conversation and so sometimes the last line of that conversation will set us up for the mood of the scene that we find ourselves in Sometimes it won't. There's a great dissolve right at the end where we literally see him running into her hand, which is, yeah, it's very on the nose, but for its beauty and its execution for kind of the high drama of what this story is, I loved it. I was like, oh, that's, it looks really cool. And it's a wonderful just a final note, because we don't get a final moment between the two of them. She's just lost to him forever. And yeah, I really love that. And like I already said, this movie's so funny. It's so funny. Both of his partners are really funny in their own way. His second partner, <laughs> I wanted so much more of her. Like, I just, I was like, please talk. Like every line delivery when he's in the pool. And we see her in the shot in the distance behind him. And she's like scampering down and like crawling down slowly yeah. to get down into the pool. Yeah, I. Yeah, real big fan for sure. Yeah, I and I I have to echo all that. I, it, I, it's so inventive in mm -hmm. ways that you don't realize even after the first viewing that you're just like. Speaking about transitions, I think my favorite one, I can't remember if it, if this is the exact transition shot, but I think there's like a cup of coffee and we go into an extreme close up and then it turns into something else, mm. like a moon or something like that. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of clever. At one point when we see the dead husband with his head to the side, that turns into the inspector's had turned at exactly the same angle and it's cool it's really cool yeah it, it I, uh, yeah it's so cool i, th I think that's a great way to <laughs> summarize this movie it's just so cool and i know you said this earlier but it does surprise me in very many ways and especially mm -hmm. when it came out or at least when i watched it for the first time it was one of those movies where i'm like oh this is a movie that's going to make that impact on mm -hmm. me that just because I don't know about you, but when I, I used to say you watch a lot of movies, when you review a lot of movies too, you tend to get this disillusioned factor to you. And when you can come along with a movie where it's like, this is so much better than I actually thought it was going to be. Mm. It's nice and refreshing that 
that it just lifts your spirits for the entire day because you're like finally not like a formulaic <laughs> thing that mm-hmm. I have to like struggle to get through or something like that because there are those where I'm like this movie because it mm-hmm. would be so horribly bad but yeah I feel that but yeah I guess talking about more of the technical side of it um, I know we already talked about uh, Park Chan Wook before but I want to talk specifically about the direction of the movie. Sure. Now you've watched more movies uh, of his than I have. So I guess, how does this compare to his other movies? You talked about Stoker, old boy, handmaiden. And what, how does this differentiate itself and make it just so much makes itself stand out amongst that? Sure. What I will say is all of his movies definitely have humor. And I wouldn't call any of his movies that I have seen. I wouldn't call them formulaic. They do feel fresh. Now, this is coming from an American who grew up in New York, who has seen, I've seen Korean films, but I'm not a Korean film expert. And so perhaps to someone living in South Korea, they're like, ah, this guy's, he's fine. I like how I feel about Steven Spielberg. I'm like, yeah, he's fine. It's okay. Jurassic Park. Yeah, that's a fine movie. Okay. (laughs) Fableman's good. Sure. Sure. Whatever. But so to me, I, I, I do feel more engaged. I do feel like my brain is lit up in different ways from watching his movies. But as far as this one, it does seem to be. It just seems like he's having more fun. I know that we end in a pretty tragic place. I'm thinking of the scene where she first lifts up her skirt to show him the cuts on her leg. And he's, oh, I'll get a female detective. And she's, yeah, it's okay. And so then the female detective walks in the room as he's like kneeling down, like taking a shirt, yeah, her, taking a picture of her leg. It just feels like he's having a lot more fun. And like we were mentioning like the transition shots, it still looks beautiful. Another shot that I... I'm not a big fan of like hyperbole, but when I tell you like my jaw dropped when they're up on the mountain and she has the headlamp and he looks at her and you can't really make her out. You just see this like light looking at him and you can see the outline. I was like, dude, I want they hold it for several seconds, but I was like, I could have watched that for a full minute just looking at that. So it does seem like someone who he knows the form, he knows the the trade of making films and at this point he's having fun with it yeah and he's really i think in terms of the editing he's really trying to hold back yet and say because you talked about that moment where we hold on it for a few seconds that's a moment where you know professionally i'm thinking oh what is he doing Mm -hmm. why is this important but then mm-hmm. you sit with it a few more seconds and you, it clicks. Yeah, this movie is also very patient. Like I said, as you're watching it, you have no indication of where this story is going. And you don't realize that you're watching like act one of a two act movie. And yeah. I would credit that to their patience in letting the story tell itself, not being in a rush to introduce the real characters or the real story. (laughs) The whole thing is the real story. Yeah, and it really doesn't even try to say, to spoon feed you, that's happening. It Mm -hmm. just says, hey, hold with us. It's going to be a long ride, but you'll love it. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, I mean, in terms of not spoon feeding us, you know, the next time that we see... um, Tane way after she's cleared and he discovers that she actually probably did it and he leaves her in the apartment she's getting slapped around by a dude we've never seen before in a place we've never seen before she takes a wig off and we're like wait he he's yelling about his grand he, he's yelling about his mother is sick mm-hmm. and we're like is this one of the grand that she's what are we talking about yeah, we're just thrown into this whole other storyline, and we have no. He's yelling, 
the guy's yelling about her husband. We're like, her husband's dead. What are you talking about? And confusing the audience for a few minutes doesn't really matter. Because again, it's a mystery and we're playing on the mystery idea. And it's great. It's masterful. Sometimes when a movie pulls the rug out from the audience does not enjoy it. They don't appreciate that. But here it just, it works really well. Yeah, because I think the thing I appreciated most is that it places you in the detective's experiences. He's confused too, so you're just mm-hmm. along, along, along the ride with them. Mm-hmm. And, and no, people do not like when it sometimes when the rug is pulled underneath them. Mm-hmm. Looking at you, Snoke. Yeah. But <laughs> oh well, that's a conversation for another time. But yeah, that's a nine-hour podcast. T- that's one thing that I actually loved very much but yeah yeah maybe a patreon exclusive (laughs) for some of us talking about it (laughs) but getting back to a decision to leave i thought it was it is that embroiling of two different genres it's Mm -hmm. not not necessarily a romantic comedy more of a romantic drama mixed with neo-noir elements where you even experienced the meat cute and you talked about that scene with the with oh you can examine my legs it's fine it is played like oh are what's about to happen right now is this is this allowed and just it brings up all these moral questions but also you also want to see where it goes to that i have to give a uh, huge credit to the performances as well yeah what did you think of those performances The two, I would have to say (laughs) my favorite performance is his second partner. Definitely. That's just like a fan favorite. It's not the best. It's just, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so drawn into this. But Park Hay-Ill and Tane Wei, they're really good. I was not as taken with Tane Wei as everyone was. Everyone was like, ah, this is the best actress performance and she should win all these awards. And no, she's great. I think it's great. But I definitely was more with Park Hale in this one. Like, he's pathetic in a way. You have this guy who can't sleep, right? And he can't sleep because he has these unsolved crimes. And so he does these stakeouts, but he's also purposefully we know that they have a weekend marriage like his wife mentioned and he doesn't hate his wife but he's also not really clamoring to be with her he comes across this woman and just every part of his life kind of unravels and i don't think that's because the power of her personality or magnetism i think that's because this is a guy who is primed to unravel sleep deprivation will do a lot to your judgment (laughs) and to your personality and he gets to watch her while he's on the job he gets to combine these two areas of his life where with his wife when he's with her, he can't be a detective. He's in a different district. He like literally yeah. can't do his job. And so this woman comes into his life where now he's watching her in two ways. The way in which he's watching her is it's, it's dual. He's doing it for his job, but he's also interested in her. So I love when we get like a pathetic guy to follow around. And I don't say that to say that he's not nice to say that he's not capable he just he isn't strong in in a lot of ways and i love that scene in the middle where he does realize oh yeah she did this and he doesn't say i know that you did it and i bought granny another phone and i'm gonna help you destroy this one and now we can be together he just says it he's completely defeated he's undone and walks away He just leaves her like he doesn't even have the faculties to. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know how to say this. Like he doesn't have the wherewithal to meet her on the level where she is and where he wants to meet her romantically. Because he's just he's undone. And the fact that he has tampered with evidence 
and covered up a murder. And we see that his wife was the youngest ever nuclear reactor manager. We know that he was the youngest ever inspector. And so these are clearly a couple who are like type A. Yeah. Um, They're go-getters, they're achievers. And he has just let, he's let his marriage fall apart because of her. He's let his career fall apart because of her, his own personal character and morals. And I love it. I love to see it. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's my read on it too. And I will say 2022 was the year for wimpy guys in movies. Sure. I think, I think, no, Drive My Car was 2021, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm of a similar read. Gosh, I, I will say that, oh, what's her name? Tang Wei, I think her performance kind of leans way to melodrama at some points. Mm-hmm. But I actually think, I have an alternate theory for why he was interested in her from the beginning. I think because I think logically this is just where my mind went. It, I think it was, she was a mystery for him to solve Mm. and illusion was broken. He was like, okay, I'm done. I can't, I, if you're not interesting to me, if I can't like analyze you, then I have no interest. Yeah. And I think that she, I think that character would agree with that because she says, guess what? Now I'll always be on your wall. I'll always be unsolved. You And you yeah. will think of me forever. Yeah. And almost asserting a kind of power over him that she knows Definitely. you'll never forget about me. You, even if oh, yeah. 20 years from now, you're going to uh, like rock, rock it up from your bed and th- think, oh, I didn't solve that. But yeah. As for Parkway, I think he did well. I think he could have done a little bit more because there are some times where I think just a little bit more would have would have worked a little bit more for me because mm. there are times where you're just thinking, this guy has a blank expression on his face. What's going on? <laughs> what is going on in that head of yours? Yeah. And you're just left there, sitting there, and you're just like, that is my thing is my thing buffering is right, right, uh, right but no but i nevertheless i enjoyed i enjoyed both performances even though i think they do leave a little bit wanting from the viewer mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. but yeah i think actually this would make a good pairing with the, uh, drive my car honestly uh, sure in the, in the lexicon of wimpy performances <laughs> but but yeah i but yeah, uh, other than that, gosh, I guess we have to get into the big thing. Mm-hmm. What did you think about and inter- how did you in- specifically interpret the ending of the movie? I'm not 100% honestly on her motivations. I don't, I think that there's like a little bit lost on me culturally on understanding the whole thing about her grandfather was a soldier and the possession of the mountain that I felt like I was missing some cultural context to really understand. Like I get it. And I know that the movie is telling us something about these two different cultures coming together in, in her character I do like how we have the whole broken communication between them throughout the movie, how they're communicating through translator apps and towards the end there, she's speaking to him in Chinese and he's speak to me in Korean. I don't know what you're saying. And to us, I don't know about you. I don't speak Chinese or Korean. And so I don't, I had no idea that she was speaking a different language at certain parts. But so I feel like the ending would have made more sense. I feel like that's the piece that I'm missing. I love the horror of the ending. Like I said, this is definitely the funniest movie of his that I have seen. I laughed a lot more. But when we come to the final sequence, it's just horrifying. It goes on a lot longer than I remember. (laughs) Not that's a bad thing, but yeah, when I 
got to the last like 20 ish minutes, I checked the time and I was like, oh, wow, we're going to be at this beach for a long time. (laughs) But yeah, I think it's I think it's a great tragic ending. And there's something very there's something very just like Greek tragedy about it, like burying yourself at the ocean while someone is essentially walking over your grave looking for you it's yeah i don't know that the execution for me like pulls you in no as much as describing it sounds pretty horrible and then watching it it's a lot more slow and melancholic but but yeah i thought it was good yeah yeah i think it was the cinematic equivalent of this is going to be an audio engineering joke, so I apologize in advance. Of of a studio fade out is how it felt to yeah. me. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. instead of like a five to ten second studio fade out, it's like a twenty minute studio yeah. fade out where you're just like, <laughs> where you're just like, okay, I get it, but yeah. like this could, yeah, I I didn't get that either. Like I felt like you said, like I was missing something really important that. And maybe that's the point. Maybe the point is that we're that since we're with the detective for so long and in that mindset for most of the movie, that we're not supposed to know the like that critical piece, that uh, last ten percent mm. of why it ends. the detective doesn't know how it ends. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, but I will say. It's one of my favorite endings from recent years. And whenever someone mentions decision to leave, I remember that ending. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, I, yeah, it's part of the reason why I wanted to talk about it a year later, other than obviously the criterion collection thing, which I, I love that cover art, by the way. And, but yeah, I, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really love this movie. It, Probably ended up in my top 20 of that of last year Mm. or something like that. I'd have to go look and verify, but because I watched over 200 films, so maybe it's in like the top 50. Right. But but yeah, it's definitely up there for me. I I fully plan to once Old Boy Remastered is out or whatever you want to call it, go back again to Decision to Leave and really just Mm. see it as a whole as a piece of his filmography rather on than by its own. So I can maybe recognize some of the patterns from his other uh, movies in this. And it's funny. We talked about it earlier, the handmaiden. I was like literally five seconds away from watching that in 2019, but I forget what it was, but I just didn't hit play or something. I, sure. I forget what it was, but but yeah, I definitely plan to do a, a marathon or whatever when that comes out. Are you going to do that? Or are you going to watch Old Boy Remastered again? Yeah, I don't know why. I When it came to theaters, I think I just I didn't have time or like I was going to have time to see one movie that week. And there was one that I was going to do for the show or something. And so it didn't happen. But Old Boy is not a movie that I revisit often. It's a phenomenal movie. You will understand when you see it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was going to say his movie JSA or Joint Security Area, that's the one that I would pair with Decision to Leave the Most because you also get some really good humor, some tense situations, but it's about so it's about the it's about the joint security area between North and South Korea. And the soldiers who are there at the border. And so you get more humor or insight into kind of Korean bureaucracy. Like a little like you get a little bit here within the police department. Interesting. So I guess one thing about old boy. I do have some spoilers that I Mm -hmm. already like because a movie that came out in 2004, obviously you're going to get spoiled. Yeah. So this is the question that's going to make everyone squirm about old boy. Yeah. Do I also watch the Josh Brolin one? You mean, do you also watch the Spike Lee one? But yes, 
I'm a big fan of Spike Lee, real big fan of him. I think that when we talk about American masters, it should be Spike Lee, Martin Scorsese. You know what I mean? Like he's very often not mentioned because he has a few, he has a few that are not great. <laughs> and old boy is, is one of those. So I would say no, honestly, I, okay. I'm not big into telling people not to watch movies because there have been movies that I was told not to watch that when I finally watched them, I was like, this movie's amazing. What's wrong with you? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like when I watched Showgirls for the first time, I was like, what is wrong with everybody? Come on, man. This movie rules. But having said all that, yeah, you can skip the Spike Lee old boy. <laughs> oh, okay, good. I, I probably was going to anyways, because I don't think I need the, the dynamics of some of the stuff that happens in the MCU. I, I've seen a certain scene from that movie. For sure. With him and Elizabeth Olsen. Yeah, and that's also painful for me to not recommend Old Boy because I love Elizabeth Olsen. I love yeah, her and same everything that I've seen her in. And honestly, her inclusion in the Marvel movies was like one of the reasons why I stayed watching Marvel movies for, <laughs> for as long as I did. Because I was like, ah, Elizabeth Olsen is great. These movies can't be that bad if she's in them. But yeah, it's just comparing the two. The first, the original Old Boy is a triumph of filmmaking. And yeah, the other one isn't. Yeah. Yeah, she's WandaVision was what kept me going because I said yeah. I was done with Endgame. I was done with the MCU after Endgame. And then I was like, ooh, WandaVision looks cool. Ooh, Spider-Man No Way Home looks cool. Yeah, WandaVision and then, was great. I, I still love WandaVision. And now I'm trapped by the MCU. I'm just trapped. <laughs> I'm watching Loki yeah. season two. Uh, I I dropped off of the TV shows because I was like, oh, they're really not like any anything that's going to connect these shows to the movies and to each other. I can literally read in like a 30 second summary. <laughs> I did drop off of the TV shows. I'm looking forward to the Marvels. I like Brie Larson. I thought Kamala Khan is like maybe the most, what's the word, charismatic mm -hmm. character since Tony Stark. And <laughs> that is what these movies are like desperately lacking. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it, but I... Yeah, I think I'll just I think I'll keep it at that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll say this. Eternals is my favorite Marvel movie since Endgame. So that might tell you something about okay, how I yeah. feel about Marvel movies. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Guardians was mine. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Gar the end of Guardians 3 had me crying like a baby. Same. Yeah, same. Uh, I haven't did I haven't did so in my uh, Patreon commentary. Yeah, it's good. But with that said, yeah, I just want to thank you for coming on and talking with me about a decision to leave. It's so cool to get to talk to guests week like two, two or three times a week from my perspective. Sure. And then to see how people react to it, it has been really cool. But yeah, thank you for coming on. Of course. It's always cool to talk to someone somewhat face to face after following yeah, each other for uh, a long time. And speaking of following each other, where can people follow you on social media? Sure. So the best thing to do is just follow the podcast. Okay. Uh, so Movie Friends Podcast at Instagram, Movie Friends Pod on Twitter. And then my personal Twitter is O H Sethy, S E T H Y, O Sethy on Twitter. And I love talking about movies with anyone, anytime. You can. DM me. We can talk about movies. You can yeah. comment on anything. The whole audience participation is a huge part of our podcast. We like base our whole audio episode structure off of it. And so we love interacting with people. My co-host, Michelle, she always says friendship is my favorite thing. And while movies are my favorite thing, friendship is my second favorite thing. Yeah, but I'll make sure to follow your podcast, both on Patreon and on socials, which actually has me thinking of, of an idea where maybe I should do, 
I don't know. I, I feel like I should be doing the podcast as its own special separate account. I, because I had my personal account first, mm -hmm. that's why I made the stuff for the podcast. And then also it's just easier to keep track of. And there's things that I want to say from my personal that I wouldn't say from the show and kind of vice versa. <laughs> like yeah. I will, I will retweet when the podcast says, Hey, a new episode is out. But for me, like I, I, I hate spamming people that I follow with the fact that I do a podcast, which yeah. <laughs> you should never be ashamed of self-promotion, but it's, I want to keep some semblance that I'm a real human being that isn't just like <laughs> interacting with people so that they'll follow my show. And yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but with that said, and I, and I do feel that like whenever I, send my tweets over to our, our group chats. I'm like, oh. what though? As long as you still have that little thing inside of your brain and inside of your heart that's going, ooh, that's, <laughs> how, that's how you haven't gone off the deep end. Inner code factor 75. Yeah. Uh, no, I don't have a factor <laughs> sponsorship and that's actually a real factor uh, code. Sure. So I guess use it. I, I, but... For now, you can follow me on social media at Austin B Media on, let's get the whole list, Blue Sky, Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. Mastodon, and Pebble, which I just Whoa. learned today is shutting down. So, oh, okay. So for not follow, much longer. Follow Austin quickly on yeah. Pebble before you can't. <laughs> Probably by the time this episode is out, it'll be shut down. Um, wow. At, at, but what isn't going away anytime soon is threads. We're also at Austin B media on the platform formerly known as Twitter X. You can follow me at Austin B media underscore because the brain dead burn bird app won't let me take somebody else's username. Got it. For whatever reason, even though that account got deactivated, but whatever I talk about it every episode, I'm not mad. You're mad. <laughs> and then on Letterboxd, I'm on there at Austin B movies. But with that said, thank you all for listening or watching the Austin B Media Podcast. I've been your host, Austin Belzer. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to either the YouTube channel if you're watching there uh, or the podcast and leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app if that's available in your app. I think Spotify, Apple Podcasts are the two places you can do it. Um, but with that said, until next time.